for tonight's question night, one of the things, so on our last question night, we had some really sensitive questions about um, sexuality that came up. And I had two people come up to me, actually like four people come up to me and say, I don't think you actually answered the questions. And I was like, did I not answer the questions? I thought I did. But uh, that tells me that maybe I needed, I needed to review those and be super clear, okay? So part of it's going to be review, and then if we have time, we'll also do a new one, okay? Sound good? We have, actually, we're definitely going to do one new one, might do two new ones, okay? All right, so here we go. So here were the questions, okay? The first question is, what is your opinion on bisexual Christianity? Do you think it's wrong from a biblical perspective? Is it right? The second question was, Will you still go to heaven if you are gay? And then the third question was, was, is a new one, and it's this one. How can someone say they are a gay Christian? Can it be that gay is just their sin, or can they be gay and still be saved? Okay? Okay? So these, these are the questions. Two of the questions were the questions that were asked two weeks ago when we did this, or three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Yes, the last time we had questions. And then I think that you were one of the people who were like, I don't think you actually answered the question. <laughs> right? so, a, couple, a couple of people, okay? So I want to I do a little bit of review, because what I did last time was these questions, I, what I did more time last time when I answered these questions was I asked, what are, what are the questions, what are we standing on when these questions are asked? I wanted to give a bigger worldview um, answer to the whole question, because a lot of these questions actually come loaded with assumptions about truth, about what the Bi- is Bible our source of truth, or is do we believe that the world is just made up of material and energy over time, right? So I, I give you a really big worldview answer to these, okay? So um, that the, what I went over last time was I, I gave you the, the, you know, I also said one of the questions asks this, it, what is your opinion, right? And one of the things I said last time was that if my, my opinion on this really doesn't matter, right? My opinion doesn't matter. The question is, what does God's word say, okay? And if God's, and, and, and I gave you that whole diagram of the, you know, the what is, what is our understanding of worldview? Is the, is the whole universe all just material time, chance, energy over time? And if so, then we're all just free to make up stuff, whatever we want. But also, if that's the truth, then nothing really matters at all. So we're all just kind of, uh, Shakespeare called it, uh, uh, we're all just the story of a madman, right? We're all just the story of a madman that's all sound and fury but no meaning, okay? So... What we're going to talk, we're going to address these head on. And one of the things that I said is that the, 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 the question of has God spoken is absolutely crucial to this, these questions. If God hasn't spoken or if God hasn't spoken to these questions, then there's not really anything that I can answer you. But the, but the reality is that God has spoken and he has spoken specifically on these things. And so we talked about how in the beginning God created man and woman in his image, and as he created them in his image, he also defined what marriage is, and he defines marriage as being between a man and a woman. And then we talked about how the Bible isn't silent on this on this question in terms of understanding it as uh, against God's law, both his written law and against his law revealed in nature. And I also share with you my experience about knowing and loving a lot of people who struggle with this question, struggle with the same-sex attraction, okay? So I want to answer now the questions super clearly, okay? So the first question is this. What is your opinion on bisexual Christianity? Do you think it is wrong? From a biblical perspective, it is right. So what is bisexuality? Bisexuality is just one of the many new sexual identities that the world has cooked up in the last 50, 60, 70 years. If you were to ask somebody 100 years ago about bisexuality, no one would know what you're talking about. Okay? It's a novel term to a novel term that's been put on a, a, an observation, something that's been going on for a long time. Okay? The, the behavior of same-sex attraction has been going on for a long time, actually something the Bible even talks about, okay? It's been going on so long, the Bible hasn't been silent on it. But the question of bisexual Christianity in terms of what is bisexuality is something that is a term that's been, is relatively new. And it's new because 
Um, and and it's, it makes sense that our world would start to think this way because our world is increasingly becoming more and more materialistic in their understanding of the world. They, our world, the worldview that is more and more and more dominant these days is the worldview that says everything is just material, time, chance, matter. And if, if that's all it is, then we just look at see what stuff is, and then we say we, we can keep doing that. We, don't, we, we, we get our definitions and our rules from what we see rather than what God says, okay? So the question is, the, or the answer to this is, the Bible is not silent on this. Again, I brought up this last time. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay? The Bible then builds on this definition of creation and God saying the two shall become one flesh man and woman a man shall leave his father this is what I covered last time and become one flesh that's what marriage is and the Bible affirms that definition of marriage a man and a woman coming together to be married in the covenant of marriage and the Bible only affirms that That sexual relationship between a married man and woman, that's it, okay? The Bible never affirms any other definitions of sexuality outside of that definition. That means the Bible also doesn't affirm sexual relations before marriage. It also doesn't affirm adultery within marriage. And it definitely doesn't affirm homosexuality, bisexuality, all the new sexualities that we have been inventing, okay? So it also makes clear in other places, like I brought up in Leviticus, where homosexuality is called a sin, and it's specifically called an abomination. That's kind of like, it sounds like a harsh word, but the word abomination is just another word for sin that is tightly related to idolatry, okay? If you look up the word abomination in the Bible, every single time it comes up, it has to do with specifically idolatry, okay? And idolatry is when you worship another god other than the God of the Bible, okay? You make a fake God up. You, and, and here's what happens. When you make an idol, what you're saying, you're creating a new reality because God of the Bible is the one who made everything and he defines everything and he tells us what our gender is. He tells us what the world is. He tells us what's right and what's wrong. Idolatry is saying, I don't want that God. I'm gonna make my own God. And so it makes sense that when sexuality gets unhinged from God, it also is tied to idolatry because it's trying to remake reality outside of God's definitions. That's, what, uh, that's one of the reasons why I believe every time homosexuality, is brought up, homosexuality in the Bible is brought up, it's tied to abomination, this idea of idolatry, because it's, it's, redefining, it's redefining who we are, and we're made in the image of God, so you can't redefine who we are without redefining who God is, which is idolatry, Okay? So the Bible also refers to it as judgment, okay? Not only is it something that is sinful, not it is some, only, only something that is contrary to, to what God has made and made us to be, it is also described as judgment, meaning if you, if, if someone who's given over to this and, and, and believes in this and runs headlong after this is experiencing judgment, okay? Listen to this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. See, that's the language of idolatry. We give up the truth of God. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. And then right after that, Paul says this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up. He gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. You see how what you do with your bodies is tied to what you, whether or not you're exchanging God for, the truth about God for a lie? That's what he's saying here, okay? 
Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, that the desires of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And now look at this direct link he makes, okay? For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women, exchanged natural relations, that would be a relationship towards a man, for those that are contrary to nature, that it would be homosexual relations. And the men, likewise, gave up natural relations with the women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. You can't get more explicit than Romans 1. Romans 1 makes it abundantly clear that this is something that is contrary to the truth of God's word as he, as he has revealed it, and it is absolutely something that you should desire to be saved from if you struggle with it. All, any, everybody who sins is under judgment, and that's why Christ came into the world, to save those from sin. This makes it abundantly clear that this is actually part of that judgment, and we should desire for God to save us from it if this is something you struggle with. So, to answer this question abundantly clear, what is my opinion on bisexual Christianity? There's no such thing as bisexual Christianity. And it's bisexuality, homosexuality is actually contrary to the Bible's teaching, which I, we don't have Christianity without the Bible. And if you disregard the Bible, you might as well just say it's whatever your name is. Call it that. That's your religion, whatever your own name is, if you're going to make it up, right? The Bible tells us what is true, and it reveals to us who Christ is. And if you reject what the Bible says, you are rejecting God, okay? So it, it's not my opinion. This, you're either going to reject what the Bible says or not, Okay? Do I think it is wrong? Again, it doesn't matter if I think it's wrong. The Bible says it is contrary to God, his word. It's contrary to truth. It's contrary to beauty. It's contrary to the goodness because all those things are defined by God himself. And you have to exchange the truth about God for a lie in order to get there. Okay? So, and then from a biblical perspective, is it right? No. Clear answer. Okay. Next question. This one's really, this one is a lot more difficult. Okay? Okay. Will you still go to heaven if you are gay, okay? Now, given my answer to the previous question, there are just a couple different ways to answer this question because this question seems to be assuming something. It seems to be assuming that there is a human identity called being gay and whether or not people that have that identity can be saved. And I brought this up last time we talked about this. But if we're getting our understanding of our identity as humans from the Bible, we don't see that as a human identity, right? That's something that the world has made up by standing on this understanding of, of uh, everything just being material chance, etc., and there not being any revealed truth about this, okay? But if but if we, are under, if we see when God says he created man and woman in his image, if you are a man, if you are a woman, God made you that way, and he made you that way to reflect his glory. He made you that way. He gave you that identity. And that identity, it, when, when, in terms of sexuality, is geared towards mar the marriage of a man and a woman. Not, not, not saying everybody gets married. Not everybody does. But your body was made in, in terms of uh, sexuality, towards heterosexual marriage. There's no other proper use of that, and, and that actually, when done within those, those uh, parameters, is a beautiful and glorious thing that reflects God's image, okay? So, now, here is, here is the, the, the question I want to ask of this person who's asking this, Okay? If they're asking it, assuming that this is an identity, being gay is a human identity, that I would say you need to go to the Bible and, say, and understand that that's not an identity the Bible establishes, okay? That's the first thing I'd say to that question. Now, if this person is saying, can you still be saved or can you still go to heaven if you are somebody who has same-sex attraction, okay? Or if, or if you are somebody who struggles with um, same-sex attraction, my answer would be yes, Absolutely, yes, because every single person has their own sins that they deal with, and Christ died to save people from all of their unique struggles and sins that they struggle with, okay? So, 
It doesn't matter. This could say, will you still go to heaven if you were a murderer? Will you still go to heaven if you were a thief? Will you still go to heaven if you were a, uh, a liar, okay? We don't, we don't make identities. We don't say, I'm, hi, my name is uh, Rustin. I'm a, I'm a liar Christian, right? We don't say that, okay? We don't identify ourselves by our sins, okay? Now, now, if, if that's the way the question's being asked, will, will you still go to heaven if you are gay? The question all, like everybody, the question is all uh, answered by this question. Have you put your faith in Christ? Have you put your faith in Christ to be forgiven of your sins? Have you confessed your sins to him? Have you, have you laid down your sexuality to Jesus, to Jesus and, and said, save me from my sin? Okay? It doesn't matter if it's, if it's a homosexual sin. It doesn't matter if it's heterosexual sexual sin. All of your sin needs to come to, cro- to Christ, and he needs to pay for it on the cross. If you have done that with this particular sin, then absolutely, yes, you, like everyone, can be saved. God saves all kinds of sinners. Remember this passage? He says, if you didn't, or do you not know the, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, the unrighteous are anybody who is a sinner who never repents of and puts the, their sin and puts their faith in Christ. So if the question is, that first question, if this question is, will you, still go, will you still go to heaven if you never repent of being gay and put your faith in Christ? If that's what the question is asking, that's asking, will you go to heaven if you don't put your faith in Christ? And if that's what you're asking, the answer is no, because no one will go to heaven if they don't repent of their sin and put their faith in Christ. Nobody. Okay? So, but listen to what 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And I want to just say that again. Do not be deceived. This is an area where everybody's trying to deceive you on this. This is the hottest deception uh, job that Satan has right now, okay? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, no men, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying if you stay in those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will not be saved, okay? But then he t- tells these people he's talking to, he says, as such were, past tense, were some of you, but you were washed You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul is here saying that your sin, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, without Christ, you will be damned for it, okay? Without Christ, you will be damned for your sin, okay? But in Christ, no matter what your sin is, no matter what it is, you will be saved if you repent of your sin. You turn to him, put your faith in him, you trust in him, confess your sin to him. That's, that is what Paul here is saying. Now, we like, to, we like to figure out some way to maneuver around this, but don't be deceived. The only way, no one will come to the Father except through the Son, okay? He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's, no, there's none other, okay? So, this is really um, super important, and it's, this is the next question that is really similar, su- super similar to that last question, because right now there's, there are a lot of people who are trying to say you can somehow, you know, be a gay Christian, and, and, and there's varying degrees of what they mean by that, okay? So this question somebody asked last week, how can someone say they are a gay Christian can it be that gay is just their sin, or can they be gay but still be saved? So very similar to the last question. But here's what I want, here's what I want to say. Anytime you hear somebody put a word in front of the word Christian, and they say, I'm, I'm a this Christian, it's already suspect, okay? It's already suspect. If, if it, now, if it was, I am an American Christian, well, that tells me you think you're Ameri- you being an American is more important than being Christ. You are an American who is a Christian, right? Right? But... When you step back a second and say, this is, the word gay here is being, is defined by scripture as something that is sinful and needs to be washed. Christ needs to wash it by the blood. Would it, does anybody ever identify by their sin in this way and tie it to the name, name Christian? Do you ever hear people say, 
I'm an idolatrous Christian. I'm a pagan Christian. I'm a murdering Christian. I'm a stealing Christian. So how could you say I'm a gay Christian? That's, what, that's the question that I would ask the person who wants to make the claim that you can say this. And here's, here's why. The, the Bible claims that Christians, those who have been washed by the blood of Christ on the cross, have been given a new nature, a new life. A, they are now a new creation. All the old sins of our old self were all slavery, just like we've been learning about in Exodus. They were, we were slaves to our sin. And the way that slavery takes shape often is through the, ha, identifying with it. When you identify with something, you say that this, is, this defines me. When you, I, when you worship an idol, you're saying that idol defines me. Christ rescues you from the slavery of your idols and the slavery of your sin, and he defines what those things are. He rescues you from exchanging the truth of God for a lie. That's part of the rescue operation. He rescues you from the lie, slavery to the lie, okay? The Bible identifies our sin as slavery, okay? Listen to to what Paul says about this very similar kind of thing, this idea of If I'm a Christian, should I still be identified by my sin? Okay, listen to this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, okay? So first off, the question of, this is not just about, this is not just about homosexuality at this point, but, it's, but it pertains to the same question, the question, right? Some of us, we become Christians and we think, sweet, I got a, I got a get out of hell free card, I can go and live my life however I want, right? Paul says, are you kidding me? You want to live in slavery now that you've been freed from it? It was slavery. It was death. It was grotesque. You want to keep living that lie? If you want to keep living that lie, you 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 are in that. You are kind of saying, I don't actually believe in the cross, I don't actually believe in the resurrection. You are saying you're basically being so inconsistent with the, with, with the message of the cross and the resurrection of Christ that it makes Paul wonder, do you, have you really been baptized into Christ? Have you really been given the newness of life that comes from him, right? If you want to still own it and not be a slave to it anymore. We live in all kinds of conflict with all of our sin all the time. But the conflict and the tension with our sin is something that we have because... Christ is in us, and there's an old man we're fighting off, okay? Old, an old self, okay? Now, Paul goes on to make this even more explicit, okay? He says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, Christ died so that we could die for our sins and yet live. Your sin, no matter what, it's going to be paid for in death, in wrath, in hell, okay? No matter what. The question is, are you going to bear it? Or is Christ going to bear it for you? Okay? Christ came so that we could be united with him in his death, so our, death, our sins could go into the grave, and he could raise up, and we would be free, free from them. Okay? If we have been united with him in a death like his, and when you believe in Christ, you confess your sins, you put your hope in him, that's what happens. You, your sin goes upon Christ, and it dies, and you raise up to new life. It's a miracle. The Bible calls it the new birth. Okay? If we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, our old self, okay? That includes the identity of being gay. That includes the identity of being an idolater. That's the, that includes the identity of being a thief. That includes all these different identities, okay? That old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, He obliterates it. 
so that we could, would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one has died, one who has died has been set free from sin. Okay? The idea of saying, I want to still own and be identified with my sin shows you don't actually, you don't actually enjoying the freedom. You haven't actually tasted and seen that Christ is good. You don't actually know what you've been saved from. How could you actually be trusting in him if you don't actually trust him and enjoy the thing he says he gives you, right? You want to still live in slavery. Now, like I said, we live with this tension. We still struggle. We still fall. And we read that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive them. That's an ongoing life thing, always, okay? And then he says, he makes it incredibly clear here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So the question, again, was can, is there such thing as a gay Christian? There is such a thing as somebody who struggles with same-sex attraction, somebody who's been rescued from the penalty of those sins, just like there's people who are rescued from the penalty of covetousness and greed and murder and all these crazy things that Christ came into the world to save us from, okay? Yes, there are people who struggle with those things, who enjoy the freedom of knowing Christ now, absolutely. We don't any longer identify with the dead self who is now in the grave. Christ has freed us from that. Why would you identify with slavery? That's, that's the answer to that question. We don't identify with it. All right. I got time for one more question. Totally unrelated, changing gears. Did I answer the questions this time? Okay. Okay, good. Otherwise, I'll do it again next time. All right. You're like, please, no. Okay. And I just want to say, I want to just be abundantly clear about the last question. That's a really good question. And we, if you struggle with that, just like people struggle with all kinds of different sins, he's faithful and just to forgive, to wash, and to sanctify, okay? As were some of you, Paul says, okay? He's a Savior who saves to the utmost, okay? He's a glorious Savior. All right. Luke 23, 43, this is the question somebody said. In Luke 23, 43, Jesus is talking to a criminal on the cross next to him. He says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. So where do Christian souls go when they die? Do they go right to heaven? That's the question. That's part of the question. It's like a huge question that broke into two parts. Okay. Philippians 1, says this. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul's writing this in a prison. He doesn't know if he's going to die or not. So he doesn't know what to hope for. Do I hope that I get to, that, do, I get, do I hope in the, the fact that if I'm, if I'm killed, am I, I'm executed, I get to go be with Christ? Or do I hope for getting to labor more and help you more know who Jesus is, Okay. This is Paul's way of saying, if I live in the flesh, it means I get to work more to help you understand who Jesus is. But if, I, but if I die, I get to go be with Christ, okay? So Paul here is teaching, and this is something consistent throughout, throughout the um, New Testament, that those who die in Christ, if you put your faith in Christ, if he has washed you and sanctified you, you've, you've been born again because you put your trust in him, when you die, you, your soul goes to be with him. Absolutely. But there is a difference. There is a difference between dying and being with Jesus and being raised again, which all of, everybody who puts their hope in Christ is also looking forward to what's called the new heavens and the new earth and the resurrection. Just like Jesus was raised from the dead and he had a physical body when he rose up, those who put their faith in Christ eventually will also rise up with the, with the physical body too, which means you're, if you die and you're with Christ, you're actually waiting. You're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for your resurrection. That's one of the things that, that the scriptures teach, and I want to show you that, um, but I'll answer it, and I'll continue that as I continue the question. This is the other half of this question, okay? 
In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes that the heavens will pass away and with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done in it will be disclosed. Later, Peter writes that we will wait for the new heavens and new earth where righteousness is at home. So what is your theory on, theory on this? Do Christian souls go to heaven when they die? And then later when Jesus returns, the heaven along with the earth will be made new? To me, it makes sense that the earth would be made new since it's full of sinners, but why heaven? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Essentially, the question is asking, um, Paul se- Peter seems to indicate that there is a judgment that happens, right? And then there is a new heavens and new earth that are, earth that are made. And in the judgment, Peter, the language Peter uses is very interesting. He says, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done in it will be disclosed. And that language is language of it's language of finality. It's language of everything is finally laid bare. And this, I believe this has to do with the second coming where Christ comes and everything is exposed. Everybody's sins are exposed. Everybody's trust, do they trust in Christ or not, is exposed. And everything that, he says, everything that is done in it will be disclosed, okay? And then he later writes, that there's a new heavens and a new earth coming. I don't believe Peter here is talking about the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will be dissolved with fire. I don't actually believe he's talking about a complete destruction of the, of the material universe. I think, I think that he's talking about a complete leveling and revealing of everything, everything that's really going on behind our hearts and, and judgment. Because there's never any point in Scripture where there's a, there's a period of complete destruction that isn't also immediately followed by new heavens and new earth. If, if there is a complete destruction, it is immediately followed by new heavens and new earth, which is kind of like the resurrection of Jesus, but with the whole world being resurrected. So listen to this. This is where, um, this is where I get all my answers to that question. And it's, a, and it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, 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 a heady question, but listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. He's talking about his own sufferings and how the hope of the future gives him the strength to walk faithfully. Listen to what he says. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is a crazy passage, but what it's basically saying is this, okay? Creation was subjected to futility, brokenness. There's the reason why weeds grow in your garden, okay? The reason why there are sicknesses and illnesses that put our friends in the hospital, okay? The reason all these things happen is because sin has entered the world, and with sin, the curse has come upon it because the world and all creation was subjected to man, okay? And remember I said the identity of, of Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them dominion over all the works of his hands. Well, because Adam was given charge over it, when he sinned, everything under his charge fell with him. And that includes creation. But he says the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What is he talking about here? Well, this is what I think he's saying here. And, and there's lots of passages that make me think that this is what he's saying here. But this is the best place to give you the full scope, okay? What he's saying here is that there's going to be a day in the future when all the people who died and the people who either went to be with Christ or did not go to be with Christ, they will rise, okay? They will rise, just like Jesus rose from the grave. Revelation talks about two different resurrections, one resurrection unto death, that's judgment, and one resurrection unto life, that's those who were resurrected in Christ, okay? And then when, those, when that day comes, when the res- great resurrection happens, those who are in Christ are raised from the dead. At that same raising of those people in Christ, the creation will also be liberated from its sub- being subjected to futility, Okay? And that is talking about the new heavens and the new earth coming, okay? So, 
And that's what, and that's what he says here in Romans 8, 18 to 23. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. He's talking about our resurrection. The, the, the story that Scripture tells about heaven when I was your guys' age, I thought it was just like going up into the clouds and playing on, fl- on flutes and harps or whatever like that, you know? The scriptures paint this worldwide redemption. All the brokenness in creation being redeemed. Christ on the throne sits and says, behold, I'm making all things new. Okay? That's, that's the picture that... that, that that Christ tells us. So the question is asking, so what's going to, what, what is it? Is it like, are, do you, when you die, you go to heaven to be with Christ and you are waiting. And actually Thessalonians says, so what happens when people who aren't dead and people who are dead, when that's, when that moment happens? And he says, well, the dead rise first and then we go and we meet Christ. Okay. So that's, that's all in the category of eschatology, which gets really confusing because it's like, talking about things in the future, but the basic thing that Scripture teaches that's abundantly clear is that if you're in Christ, you have, you have to look forward to two things. One, if you die before Christ comes back, you get to be with Him in heaven, and you wait until your body is resurrected. If you're alive when He comes back, you are changed into your resurrected body. That's what Thessalonians says. Kind of interesting. All right. Okay. <sighs> I heard a big sigh. All right, I'm going to pray, and then we'll go play four square in the air. God, I thank you for these questions. God, I thank you that we have this beautiful scope in your word about the, um, the reach of your redemption. Uh, you come to, bl- to, your blessings come to even the uttermost. I'm reminded of that song that goes, he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. There's nothing that sin has marred that you don't intend on making right. God, we pray that the hearts of everybody in here would be made right with you by putting their trust and their faith in you. In your name we pray, amen. All right. No.